Zinger Four Star Playhouse presents Dick Powell, Charles Boyer, David Niven, Ida Lupino. Ickenham Hall, one of the stately homes of England. The present Earl of Ickenham, a man of varied interests, annually emerges from his country retreat and journeys to London, there to engage in enterprises of one kind or another. I'm the Earl of Ickenham. I'm looking for my nephew, Pongo Twistleton. Oh, yes. Mr. Twistleton is expecting you. He said he'd be waiting for you at the main staircase. Oh! Thank you, madam. Oh, there you are, Pongo. Everything under control? Good morning, Uncle Fred. Everything's under control. I have tickets for the dog races. Oh, no. Oh, no. Wild horses wouldn't drag me to the dog races, nor the men of interest would wild dogs drag me to the horse races. I have plans for a pleasant and instructive afternoon. I don't want to carp or criticize in any way, but what about those teeth? Are they going to stay in your face all day? I almost forgot. Now, where were we? Making plans for a pleasant and instructive afternoon, I believe. Yes, that's right. Just place yourself in my hands, Ponga, my lad, and leave the program entirely to me. The last time you came up to London, and I left the program entirely to you, I wound up being fined ten pounds for putting burnt cork on my face, a turban on my head, and distributing coconuts outside the House of Commons on behalf of the Sultan of Zanzibar. A splendid day. But nothing like that this time. I intend to take you to visit the home of your ancestors. But I always thought that Ickenham Hall was the home of my ancestors. Well, Ickenham is one of the homes of your ancestors, true. However, they also resided rather near the heart of things, at a place called Mitching Hill. Down in the suburbs, do you mean? Well, the neighborhood is suburban now, it's true. Uh, it's many years since the meadows in which I sported as a boy were sold and cut up into building lots. When I was a child, Mitching Hill was a vast rolling estate belonging to your great-uncle Marmaduke. I've long harbored a sentimental urge to see what the old place looks like now. Perfectly foul, I expect. Yes, they probably. Still, I think we ought to make the pious pilgrimage. Let's press on, then. Is there a dentist in the house? Yes, sir. With Mr. Twistleton's compliments. <laughs> Just over there was when I plugged the gardener in his seat with my bow and arrow. And over there, I was uh, sick after smoking my first cigar. And just over the... Oh, blast, it's beginning to rain. Hooray! Pongo! Come to heel. Oh, to be in England, now that April's there. Do we know these people? Certainly not. Steady there, Uncle Fred. Panic. Just leave everything to me. Good afternoon. Afternoon. Is this the Cedars? This is the Cedars. Are the uh, old folks at home? There's nobody at home. I'm the daily. Hello. I've come to clip the parrot's toenails. And this is my assistant, Mr. Walkinshaw, who administers the anaesthetic. To work, to work, Walkinshaw. Are you from the bird shop? A uh, happy guess. Well, they never said you were coming. Well, they keep things from you, do they? Most reprehensible. And how is our feathered friend today? Well, I suppose it's all right, but I would just leave. Off you go. We leave the place in good order. Good day. Ah, ah, shut up, you rude thing. If you ask me, somebody ought to clip its wings for good, if you know what I mean. Huh. Not, I take it, a, a true bird lover. Well, here we are. Smug and cosy instead of catching our deaths of cold outside. You won't go far wrong if you just leave things to me. But dash it all, we can't stay here. Why not? You expect me to go outside in that rain? Is that abnormal? I mean, it's not an atomic shower, it's just water. Obviously, you're not aware of the grave issues involved. 
Shortly before I left home this morning, I had a, a serious disagreement with your Aunt Jane. She said that the weather was treacherous and requested me to wear my woolly muffler. I replied that the weather was not treacherous and that I hadn't the faintest intention of wearing my woolly muffler. Finally, by the exercise of an iron will, I won my point. I left home with no woolly muffler. Now, my dear boy, I ask you to envisage what would happen if I return home with a cold in the head. The next time I come to London will be complete with a liver pad and respirator. Nope. I shall remain here, happily toasting my toes in front of this really excellent fire. I had no idea that these gas contraptions put out such a heat. I feel all of a glow. So am I. Suppose the blighter who owns this ghastly place comes back. Try that one over on your pianola. There! Don't say there like that. It's the sort of noise your Aunt Jane makes. What are we going to do? Well, don't run around like a decapitated chicken. I see no cause for alarm. But obviously, this is some casual caller. If it was the owner of the house, he'd use his key. Go and see who it is. It's a pink chap. How pink? Pretty pink. Obviously, he's not the owner of this house. Chaps who own houses like this are not pink chaps, they're pale green chaps. Comes from working in offices and things like that. Go and see what he wants. You go and see what he wants. We'll both go and see what he wants. Pardon me, sir. Is Mr. Rodders in? No. Yes. You silly Douglas, of course I'm in. I am Mr. Roddy, sir. And this, such as he is, is my son, Douglas. And you? Oh, a name of Robinson, sir. Name of Robinson. Come in, Miss Robinson. Take off your things. Thank you. Douglas, desertion is punishable by death. Close the door. It's drafty. Allow me to take your hat. Oh, thank you. Hmm. Beautiful clock, this. Douglas won it in the hundred yards dash. In the police sports. Douglas, park the parker. Do sit down. Well, what can we do for you? Is Julia here? Is she, Douglas? No. No. Well, she wired me she was coming here today. Splendid. Then we shall have a fourth for bridge. I would not... <laughs> ah! I, uh, I don't suppose you ever met Julia. A bit of trouble in the family she gave me to understand. Oh, that is often the way. But the Julia I mean is your niece, uh, Julia Tarmigan. Or rather, your wife's niece, Julia Tarmigan. Any niece of my wife's is a niece of mine. We share and share alike. Julia and I want to get married. Oh, go right ahead. What's to stop you? They won't let us. Who's they? Oh, uh, mother and father and Uncle Charlie Tarmigan and Uncle Henry Tarmigan and all the rest. They don't think I'm good enough. I'm told that the morality of the modern young man is notoriously lax. Oh, no, no, no. Not class enough, I mean. Oh, they're a haughty lot, those ptarmigans. Only earls have a right to be haughty. Are they earls? No, they aren't. Besides, we had words, me and a father. One thing led to another, and in the end, I called him a, a blistering old... Oh, oh, they're coming through the gate. Who's they? Oh, Julia and her mother and father. I didn't know they were all coming. What do they look like, Douglas? Fierce. How fierce? Pretty fierce. I take it you don't want to meet them. Oh, no, 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 I don't. Well, you better take cover then, Mr. Robinson. Use some initiative. Oh. Douglas, hardly the family spirit. Not the type of thing we displayed in the charge of the Light Brigade. I wish I was at the dog race. Nonsense. This situation is fraught with interest. Come on, dear boy. You're not going to let those bounders in here, are you? Of course. We Roddices keep open house. Oh, by the way, as presumably they know whether or not the man Roddice has a son, we better revert to the old layout. You're the local vet. And when they come in, I'd like to find you standing over there by the cage and peering at the bird in a scientific fashion. Tap your teeth with a pencil from time to time. Try the smell of chloroform. That'll help to add conviction. Take up your station. Welcome to the Cedars. Well, you don't know who I am, I'll be bound. 
I'm your sister-in-law, Connie. Oh. This is Claude, my husband. <clears throat> and this is my daughter, Julia. Charming, charming. Is Laura in? Laura. Your wife. Oh, Laura. No, I, I regret to say she's not. Hmm. I thought you were younger. Younger than what? Younger than you are. Well, that's pretty silly. You can't be younger than you are, can you? <laughs> we do our best. Do go inside, please. Oh. And you too, my dear. Thank you. Come in. Why don't you sit here? This is my wife's favorite chair. Sit down. I think you, sir, would be more comfortable on that. What's that? That? Ah, that is the local vet, the ministering to my parrot. I can't talk in front of him. Oh, well, he won't hear a word. He's absolutely stone deaf, poor chap. Now then. Well, although Laura never did me the honor to invite me to her wedding when you and she were married, which is the reason I haven't communicated with her in five years, necessity compels me to cross her threshold today. The time comes when differences must be forgotten and relatives must stand shoulder to shoulder. Like the boys of the old brigade, huh? What I say is, let bygones be bygones. I wouldn't have intruded on you today, but needs must. I disregard the past and appeal to your sense of pity. Have a look. Have a look. <clears throat> I want you and Laura to take Julia into your house for a week or so and until I can make further arrangements. Julia sits for her exam in, in two weeks' time, and naturally she must stay in London until then. The trouble is, she's fallen in love. Or thinks she has. I know I have. Good for you, my dear. Yesterday, Claude and I came up to London from our Bexhill home, thinking we'd give Julia a pleasant surprise. And naturally, we stayed at the same boarding house where she's been living for the last six weeks. And what do you think we discovered? Insects? Insects, no. A letter. From a young man? Yes, I, I was just filled with horror when I found it was some young man I knew nothing about who was arranging to marry my daughter. Highly understandable. Of course, I sent for him immediately and found he was quite impossible. He... He jellies eels. He does what? He's an assistant at a jelly deal shop. Well, I must say, I, I think that speaks very highly for him. After all, the ability to jelly an eel denotes an intelligence of the highest order. There are not many people who can do that, believe me. In fact, if somebody said to me, jelly this eel, I should be nonplussed. And so, unless I'm very much mistaken, would, would Anthony Eden be? Or Winston Spencer Churchill? <laughs> Nonsense. What would my husband's brother, Charlie Tarmigan, say if I allowed his niece to marry an eel jellier? Oh! Husband's brother, Henry Tarmigan. Oh! Or cousin Elf Robbins, for that matter. Precisely. Why, they'd all die of shame. I've told good times, Mother, that Wilberforce is only jellying eels till he finds something better. And what is better than an eel? Uh, for jellying purposes, I mean. Wilberforce is ambitious. It won't be long before he rises in the world. Bravo, Julia! Will be! Oh. That's him! Who's him? He's him! Oh, oh. oh Julia! Who oh, will be? Oh. Oh, do... Oh, don't just stand there. Do something. Oh, what can I do? Oh, you imbecile. Part them. Separate them. Julia, you oh. naughty girl. Oh, come away from me. Oh, no. How dare you? Oh, you separate them. Oh. Julia Tarnigan, I'm ashamed of you. Oh, so am I. I blush for you. Me too. Hugging and kissing a man who called your father a perishing old bottle nose. Just a moment. Before we go any further, I think we ought to clear up that point. If he called you a perishing old bottlenose, we have to decide whether or not you are. And I must confess, from where I stand... Wilberforce will apologize. Oh, certainly I'll apologize. Well, it isn't fair to hold a remark passed in the heat of the moment against a chap. Mr. Robinson, you know perfectly well that whatever you say makes no difference at all. If you'd been listening to what I was saying, you'd understand. I know, I know. Uncle Charlie Tarmigan and Uncle Henry Tarmigan and Cousin Alf Robbins and all that. Oh, pack of snobs. What? Who think themselves everybody just because they got money. Well, what I like to know is, is how they got it. Oh, and what do you mean by that? Of course, he's quite right, Connie, you know. You can't get away from that. What? 
I was just wondering if perhaps you'd forgotten just exactly how Charlie Ptarmigan did make his pile. What are you talking about? Oh, I know it's painful. I know we don't discuss this as a rule. But you must admit, Connie, that lending money at 250% is just not done in the best circles. And if I remember correctly, the judge said as much at the trial. Well, well. I never knew Uncle Charlie had been in court. Oh, you kept it from the child, did you? Quite right, quite right. It's a lie. A dastardly lie. And what about Henry Tarmigan when he had that spot of bother? When it was touch and go whether or not they sent him to the cooler? I ask you, Connie, was it right for a man in Henry's position of trust to sneak 50 pounds from the till in order to put it on a 100 to 1 shot in the Grand National? Not quite playing the game, you know, Connie. Not quite cricket. And what about cousin Alfred Robbins? Oh, ho, ho. There's not a word of truth in it, not a single word. I think you've gone mad. Have it your own way, Connie. The only point I'm trying to make is this, that although the jury were probably within their rights on the evidence given to give Alf the benefit of the doubt when he was charged with the smuggling you-know-what. Everybody else knew he'd been doing it for years, mark you. If a man can smuggle you-know-what and get away with it, more power to them, say I. The only point I'm trying to make is this, that we're not exactly a family that can afford to put on the dog and sneer at honest suitors for our daughter's hands. In fact, I would go as far as to say that we are extremely lucky to be able to marry even into eel-jellying circles. So do I. Surely you don't believe what this man's saying. I believe every word. So do I. Well, goodness knows I never liked Laura, but I would never have wished her a husband like you. Husband? Connie, dear, what makes you think that Laura and I are married, hmm? You'll have to let me marry Wilberforce now. He knows too much about us. That's right. That's right, I do. Well, you wouldn't mind marrying into such a low family, would you, darling? No. No, I don't suppose so. Well, after all, we needn't see them. No, that's right. Oh, it isn't relations that matter. It's ourselves. That's right, too. Oh, Wilby. Oh, Julia. Charming suburban scene. <clears throat> and what, may I ask, do you propose to marry on? Wilberforce is going to be a very rich man someday. Someday. <laughs> if I had a hundred pounds, I could buy a half share in one of the best milk grounds in South London tomorrow. If. Bah. And where are you going to get it? That is the point. Where are you going to get a hundred pounds? <laughs> I bless myself. For me, of course. Who else? I think the vet wishes to speak to me. I thought you said that chap was your son. My dear boy, if I had a son, he would not look like a cross between two pounds of cold halibut and an explosion in an umbrella factory. That is the local veterinary surgeon. I might have said that I looked upon him as a son. Perhaps that's what confused you. Yes, vet? I thought you said he was deaf. He is deaf. Deaf as a plank. I can't quite understand what the fellow says. He sprained a finger this morning and he makes him stammer. I gather he wants to speak to me in private. Perhaps there's something the matter with my parrot that he's loath to discuss, even in sign language in front of a young unmarried girl. You know what parrots are, Connie. Also, he gets slight claustrophobia in a small room. I think, I think I'll take him for a short walk. Yes, I feel like a walk. It stopped raining. Well, can we go too, sir? By all means, tag on. And you, Connie, are you going to join the hikers? I shall remain and make myself a cup of tea. You won't, I hope, begrudge us a cup of tea. Certainly not. This is Liberty Hall. Help yourself. Tuck in. Put your trotters in the trough. Claude, put the kettle on. Oh, I've forgotten a hat. Congratulations. Oh, I am terribly sorry. Don't give it a thought. It was a thing of undiluted horror anyway. Don't bother to pick up the pieces now, Connie. Tea first.
I don't know how to thank you, Uncle. <laughs> no, me either. Oh, tut tut, it was nothing. I think you're simply marvelous. Oh, mm, splendid little dividend. Uh, uh, so long, sir. I'll never forget this. Oh, so long. I don't put too much water in the milk. <laughs> <laughs> uh, come along, Julia. Bye-bye. Uh, charming. Charming child. Now, if I may speak, hmm? where did you get all that money? A good question. Where did I get it? Your Aunt Jane gave it to me. To pay some bills with, I rather fancy. She'll give you the devil when you get back. I wouldn't be in your shoes for anything. Is that a fact? When Aunt Jane finds out that you slipped her entire roll to a girl, an extremely pretty girl who looked like something out of the beauty chorus of the better sort, I should think she would pluck down one of the ancestral battle axes and strike you on the mazard. Have no anxiety, my dear boy. It's like your kind self to worry about me, but have no anxiety. I shall tell her that I gave the money to you for the purpose of buying back some rather um, compromising letters, which in a moment of zeal you wrote to a Peruvian striptease artist. She can hardly blame me for rescuing her well-loved nephew from the clutches of such an adventuress. It may well be that she will be slightly vexed with you for a while, and you will have to allow a certain amount of time to elapse before you come down to Ickenham Hall again. Luckily, I shan't require you till the ratting season opens. Uh, <coughs> excuse me, sir. Are you uh, Mr. Roddis of the, of the Cedars? That's me, Roddis of the Cedars. Ah, I am Mr. J.G. Bulstrode from uh, Shangri-La, just down the road. This is my sister's husband's rather backward brother, Percy Frensham. He's in the lard and imported butter business. Pleased to meet you, Mr. Frensham. How's the lard and imported butter business? Uh, brisk, thank you. Dash it brisk. Mr. Roddis, I haven't had uh, the pleasure of making your acquaintance, but I think it only neighborly to tell you that a short while ago, the sound of breaking glass surprised me. And I found two suspicious-looking characters had broken into your house. Into my house? I think they must have got in through the back. If you look through that window, you'll be able to see them. Blimey, you're right. They're sitting in my parlor, swigging tea and crumpets as cool as you please. Just as I thought. Smashed our blinking antique clock, too, they have. That's terrible. Opened a pot in my raspberry jam, too. Oh, Mr. Roddice, if I might make a suggestion, I think you ought to call the police. That I will. Thank you, Mr. Bulstrode. Not at all. It's a pleasure to have been of service to you. Well, I'm beginning along. I have an appointment. Pleasant after the rain, is it not? Come, Percy. The question now is, what next? You're not going to get me into that little club on the riverbank again. No, no, no. You remember what happened the last time? Yes. I still think a more intelligent magistrate would have been content with a mere reprimand, however. And I won't. No, 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 not that. Still, having successfully concluded the afternoon's operations, I think we should look around for new worlds to conquer. New worlds to conquer? In all honesty, doesn't your conscience ever trouble you? I don't know what you're talking about. In one short afternoon, you have created such chaos, havoc, and general disaster in this small community as has not been seen since the Black Plague. Pongo, I'm afraid that you are the victim of faulty thinking. And I believe you would do better to absorb a little of my wholesome philosophy. Wholesome philosophy? I wish you wouldn't repeat everything I say. It's really very irritating. Wholesome philosophy. On these infrequent visits of mine to the metropolis, I make it my aim, whenever possible, to spread sweetness and light. I look about me, even in a, a foul hole like Mitching Hill, and I ask myself, uh, how can I make this foul hole a better and a happier foul hole than when I found it? If I see the opportunity, I grab it. Now, I think we've done our good deed for the afternoon, and we should now rough out some sketchy plans for the evening. Oh, here comes our omnibus now. I wonder if the old Lester Grill is still in operation. If it is, we might drop in there for a while. Must be fully 25 years since I was thrown out of the old Leicester Grill. I wonder who the bouncer is there now. We'll find out soon enough. <laughs>